Welcome to our Wednesday Bible study. It is so good to have you with us to engage in the study of God's word. We appreciate Minister B. Chris Simpson for teaching in the month of October and helping us to be more community-minded, more ministry-minded, just really appreciate what he brings to the Marcellus Avenue Church of Christ. We're going to begin our study on this day in prayer. We always like to ask God's blessing upon our study. Let us pray at this time. Our Father in heaven, we just thank you so much for the blessings of this day, for waking us up, for new mercies that you give us each and every day. Thank you for uh, the sunshine, thank you for the rain, thank you for the heat, thank you for the cold, uh, thank you for being the God of all seasons, the God of all times. We ask that you will be with us during uh, this session of study on today. Help us uh, to gain those things from your word that you desire for us to know. Help us to grow spiritually, help us to grow emotionally, Help us to grow mentally. Help us to see your hand in our lives. In the name of your son, Jesus, we pray. Amen. On Sunday mornings, we are in a series called Divine Disruptions. So for the next few Wednesdays, what I want to do is take a deeper dive into Acts chapter 8. During the course of the sermon, uh, there are some uh, aspects that we don't get a chance to really drill down into. And so I want to take the class time to do that on uh, today and the next few weeks. We encourage you to listen to the sermon, Divine Disruptions, uh, from this past Sunday, October the 31st, 2021. You can find that sermon on our YouTube channel. If you have not subscribed to our YouTube channel, we encourage you to do so. So we are in Acts chapter eight, verses one through five. Saul was in hearty agreement with putting him to death, him being Stephen. And on that day, a great persecution began against the church in Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Some devout men buried Stephen and made loud lamentation over him. But Saul began ravaging the church, entering house after house and dragging off men and women. He would put them in prison. Therefore, those who had been scattered went about preaching the word. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and began proclaiming Christ to them. Uh, divine disruptions. Uh, on uh, this past Sunday, we mentioned how in Acts 1, Jesus instructs his apostles and he gives them this message that they were to wait in Jerusalem, be endued uh, with power from the Holy Spirit, and they would take the gospel message not only in Jerusalem, but uh, Judea. Uh, he says, you'll be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria, even to the remotest part of the earth. So as we really dissect and look at what Jesus says, uh, we see here on this map, Jerusalem, uh, the place where the church would begin, the place from which uh, the gospel would go forth. Uh, so Jerusalem is the city that is uh, in the region of Judea. And the term Judea was first used following Babylonian exile. Uh, Judea is the Latinized spelling of Judah. And so Jerusalem was the capital city of the nation of Judah. It was where the temple was built. Uh, so uh, Judah or Judea has significance going back to the Old Testament. So there was this region of Judea and 
it was one of three regions that made up uh, Palestine. The other two were Samaria and the third was Galilee. And Galilee is uh, the region from which Jesus hailed, Jesus of Nazareth. Nazareth was a city in the region of Galilee. Uh, there, uh, the, the city of Samaria in the region of Samaria had been the capital of the Northern Kingdom of Israel during the days of the divided kingdom. So Jerusalem was the capital city of Judah uh, during that time. And Samaria was uh, the capital city of Israel. Uh, but over time, Samaria uh, became to be known as a region. And, and so Philip went to uh, a city in the region of Samaria and he began to proclaim the gospel. What was it that sparked Philip uh, proclaiming the gospel? It was this great persecution that broke out following the death of Stephen. The death of St Stephen ignited uh, this persecution. It emboldened the enemy against the church. The church had grown and it blossomed 3,000 on the day of Pentecost. Acts 4 4, there are 5,000 there in the church. As the church organizes for ministry, the church continues to grow. Uh, however, uh, the church, because of its growth, began to face opposition from outsiders. Uh, growth has its challenges. So I want to ask you the question, in what ways does growth present challenges? How does growth challenge us? In, in what ways does uh, growth uh, challenge us? Uh, what, what, what are some of the challenges uh, that, that growth presents? Uh, Sometimes uh, it is conflict, an increased level of conflict that can come with growth. It could be that some people are not happy with the new way things are. They want the old way back. Uh, and so that can be a challenge of growth, being able to manage all the people. And we saw this in Acts chapter six, to do the ministry, the apostles had to assign others to do the work, those who could be faithful to handle the distribution of food. Uh, so growth will present challenges in a variety of ways. As the church seeks to recover from uh, the death of Stephen, as they mourn his loss, as they deal with uh, this persecution, uh, the church, the Bible says, uh, was scattered. The apostles remained in Jerusalem even in the face of this persecution, uh, but there were others who left Jerusalem and they were not silent about their faith. They took the gospel with them. Uh, there are times when we can be silent. Uh, we don't share the gospel as we should. Uh, so what are the obstacles and circumstances that prevent us from sharing our faith today? What are your thoughts on that? What, what's blocking you, perhaps? Or what are some of the barriers that maybe you've overcome in sharing your faith? What are the obstacles? What are the circumstances that prevent us from sharing our faith today? And how does our environment compare to that of the early church? Uh, are we less bold in some ways than uh, were the members of the early church? Are we as bold? as the early church? How does our environment compare? Uh, was our environment more friendly? Or was, is it more hostile than that of the early church? What, what are your thoughts? Obstacles that prevent you from sharing the gospel? And what are, are some of the circumstances, the, the, the challenges? Uh, so, so the church faced a uh, disruption. There was this concentration of Christians in Jerusalem, but now they had to take the gospel with them. They had to leave Jerusalem because of the persecution. And this is a paradigm shift 
for those in Jerusalem because under the law, people would make their way to Jerusalem. Uh, we saw this on the day of Pentecost. Uh, there were those from uh, regions and Parthians and Medes and people of uh, Mesopotamia, Romans and people from Cappadocia and Pontus and throughout Asia. People came from all over and they converged on Jerusalem for the day of Pentecost. So there was this sense where you come to Jerusalem in order uh, to worship God. Uh, we see this with the Ethiopian eunuch. The Ethiopian eunuch later on in uh, Acts chapter 8, he was coming to Jerusalem. He came to Jerusalem to worship. Now he's leaving Jerusalem. Uh, but Jesus says, not that the people would come to Jerusalem for the gospel, but in the instructions of Jesus, in, in the final words of Jesus, Jesus says the gospel would go forth from Jerusalem. There was a spreading out. Don't expect the people to come hear the good news. Take the good news to the people. Uh, that, that's a message for the church today. Uh, we can't just expect people to darken our doors to come and visit us. Yes, people will be curious and people may check us out online, but ultimately the call is not for those in the world to come to church. The call is for the church to enter into the world, to go forth, to spread the message. And so this persecution brought about a scattering of Christians. Uh, that, that word, that, that's used in Acts chapter 8, verse uh, number, number 2, verse number 1, rather, that the, the Christians were, were scattered. It's an interesting word. Uh, it, it, it is the word from which we get the word diaspora. Uh, we get the word diaspora from this word diaspirio is the, the Greek word. And it's a word related to the Greek word for seed. So it carries this picture of God spreading his word to bear fruit in an ever widening circle from Jerusalem. The people were scattered. And when they scattered, they scattered the seed of the word of God. Verse four, they were scattered and those who were scattered went about preaching the word. They're spreading the seed everywhere they go. There's a scattering of the seed. Wherever a Christian is, the, the seed of the word of God is scattered. The people in the early church shared their faith even in the face of persecution. There was a divine disruption in Jerusalem. Uh, and what we see is that God used this di disruption as a catalyst for the growth of the church. So God uses disruptions to our normal as catalysts for growth. God uses disruptions to grow the kingdom and to grow the individual. Uh, so how do divine disruptions aid in our growth? What is it about these uh, disruptions? How, how do they aid? How do they, they assist in our growth? Uh, the disruptions can, can spark creativity. Uh, they can cause us to rely on God. They can break up the soil of our heart uh, to allow the seed of the word of God to be planted. Uh, so, so the church is scattered. Uh, there is persecution but God uses it for the growth, the benefit of the church. How do we typically respond to the disruptions in our lives? Uh, sometimes we get frazzled. Sometimes we uh, get annoyed, frustrated. Uh, there's a sense of nervousness, uncertainty. Sometimes there's a lack of faith. And, and I think part of it is that we don't see these disruptions as divine disruptions. They feel bad. 
the persecution being thrown and drag, dragged from your home, thrown into prison, that is bad. But the Christians of the early century, first century, saw this as God working something out for good. It was an attack of the enemy, but God works in it for good. And so I want to encourage us to see the disruptions as divine disruptions. God can be doing something in the disruption. This, the disruption. Sometimes we don't know what it is, uh, but God is faithful. He's doing something in this divine disruption. Maybe uh, he is teaching us lessons. Maybe he is bringing us uh, new opportunities. He's moving us to the place where he wants us to be. So divine disruptions provide opportunities. Uh, divine disruptions, they provide opportunities for self-discovery. They provide opportunities for ministry. And, and we, we, we talked about uh, this on Sunday, how Philip seemingly discovered or, or moved into the realm of preaching as the result of a divine disruption. Uh, Acts chapter eight, verses five through eight. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and began proclaiming Christ to them. And the crowds with one accord were giving attention to what was said by Philip as they heard and saw the signs which he was performing. For in the case of many who had unclean spirits, they were coming out of them shouting with a loud voice and many who had been paralyzed and lamed, lame were healed. So there was much rejoicing in the city. There's this divine disruption. Philip uh, leaves Jerusalem, he goes to Samaria and he proclaims the gospel. He shares Christ with them. Uh, he's performing miracles. Uh, see, he, he put the kingdom first and we have to make sure that we are kingdom minded. And when God disrupts our normal, uh, that we embrace the challenges that are put before us. Uh, sometimes we are reluctant to accept that call. Uh, I wonder about Philip's reluctance to answer this call, to proclaim the word, to share the word of God. And, and it's okay to be reluctant. Uh, it's okay to accept the call and the responsibility with humility and perhaps even with some apprehension, but don't let your reluctance turn into disobedience. Uh, so often that's what we end up doing. We let our reluctance turn into disobedience and we never discover the joys and the gifts that God has for us. So how do you discover, how did you discover your gifts and talents that you could use for the kingdom? What happened in your life uh, that allowed you to realize, hey, this is what I'm good at. This is what I believe God has called me to be and God has called me to do. And how would you help someone else to discover their gifts and talents? What, what would you share? What would you say to that person? Well, sometimes we discover our gifts and talents through uh, burdens. Uh, God places a burden on our heart uh, that we have a passion for a particular group of people, a particular work. Sometimes our discovery comes through community recognition. Other people see something in us uh, that we don't see in ourselves, or uh, they confirm for us gifts that we think uh, we have. Uh, so it's okay to ask people, hey, what are some of the things that you feel I'm good at? Utilizing the community to help discover your gifts. Because through divine disruptions, more gifts can be brought out of uh, the gifts that God has given us. Uh, so what are 
some of those divine disruptions in your life. Think about your life. What have been some of those uh, divine disruptions? As you look back over your life, you see the hand of God there. Uh, you see the inconvenience, but God was with you. God was working. God was moving in it. Uh, so Philip takes the gospel to Samaria. He didn't wait on them to come to him. Uh, the city of Samaria, in the region of Samaria, uh, he goes to this city, proclaims Christ to the people, and the crowds, they pay attention to Philip. Uh, Philip is proclaiming the gospel. He's healing people. He is casting demons out of people. Sounds a lot like the ministry of Jesus. Uh, we see in Matthew chapter 4, verses 23 through Five, verse number two, Matthew 4, 23 through 5, verse 2. Jesus was going through throughout all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness among the people. And the news about him spread throughout all Syria, and they brought to him all who were ill, those who were suffering with various diseases and pains, demoniacs, epileptics, paralytics, and he healed them. Large crowds followed him from Galilee and the Decapolis and Jerusalem and Judea and from beyond the Jordan. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on the mountain and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. He opened his mouth and began to teach them. Uh, so, so we see here uh, how Jesus went about healing, but he also engaged in the ministry of the word. Uh, there was th this ministry to the felt needs of the people, but there was also this ministry to their ultimate need, which was a need for God in their lives. Uh, and so Philip continues in this vein and the work of the Lord done through Philip brought much joy to the city because the lives of the people were better because Philip was there. And Philip helped to change the condition of uh, the lives that these people were living. Uh, and so there was ministry being done. There was self-discovery on the part of Philip. Then in Acts chapter eight, verses nine through 13, now, there was a man named Simon who formerly was practicing magic in the city and astonishing the people of Samaria, claiming to be someone great. And they all from the smallest to the greatest were giving attention to him saying, this man is what is called the great power of God. And they were giving, atten they were giving him attention because he had for a long time astonished them with his magic arts. But when they believed Philip preaching the good news, of the, about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ. They were baptized, men and women alike. Even Simon himself believed. And after being baptized, he continued on with Philip. And as he observed signs and great miracles taking place, he was constantly amazed. So Philip and the Sumerians experience a divine disruption that leads to their salvation, uh, or Simon rather, Simon and the Sumerians experience a divine disruption. Simon practiced magic or sorcery, uh, and it was not the type of magic that we see today, card tricks or uh, making coins disappear. Uh, his, his magic elevated him to the status of being someone great. And he said himself, I'm someone great. He was kind of uh, enigmatic about who he was, part of the mystique uh, about being a sorcerer, being Simon. Uh, but the people started filling in blanks. And they said, Simon must be great power of God. Simon had been doing magic for a long time. Uh, he was had as an audience the educated and the uneducated, the great 
and the small. And when we look at scripture, we see that there is, in fact, a legitimacy to some of these works of darkness and witchcraft uh, is considered a work of darkness, sorcery considered a, a work of darkness. But watch what Jesus says in Matthew 24, 24. For false Christ and false prophets will arise and will show great signs and wonders so as to mislead, if possible, even the elect. Uh, Jesus himself says that people will show great signs and wonders and mislead the chosen people of God, if possible. They'll mislead others. They'll be false Christ, people who claim to be Jesus, people who claim to be a prophet, those who claim to be great, or those that people will say must be somebody special. But Jesus says that they will be fooled by the signs and wonders that these people perform. Second Thessalonians chapter two, verses eight through 10 uh, shares, then that lawless one will be revealed whom the Lord will slay with the breath of his mouth and bring to an end by the appearance of his coming. That is the one whose coming is in accord with the activity of Satan with all power and signs and false wonders and with all the deception of wickedness for those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth so as to be saved. Uh, so here in reference to uh, the end of time and the decep great deception that will occur, uh, Paul talks about this being the activity of Satan uh, but there will be power, there will be signs, uh, there will be some false wonders, people will be deceived. So the, the goal of this work that was being done, the goal is deception and distraction, deception and distraction. Satan desires to deceive us, to get us to believe a lie instead of God's truth, and he wants to distract us. If he can deceive us and distract us, he pretty much has won. If he can deceive us and get us to chase after that which is false, and if he can distract us from sharing the gospel, then he's won. So what is it that has your attention? Uh, the people of Samaria were paying attention to Simon and his false signs and wonders. Uh, what has your attention? Does God have your attention? Or, or uh, is there distraction in your life? Or are you being deceived? The people of Samaria were being deceived by Simon, but when they heard Philip preaching about the kingdom, they were baptized. Philip combined miracles with the preaching of the word, like the apostles did, uh, but while these contributed to the efficacy of his preaching, the emphasis in Acts 8 is that they obeyed the word. The word, the gospel, was what his life was dedicated to. He preached, he proclaimed the gospel. His miracles of healing may have attracted attention to him, and they opened the avenue uh, to the hearts of those men and women who would hear them. Uh, but the conversion was due to the preaching of the word. Whenever the word, the pure truth of the gospel is proclaimed with freedom, with fidelity, when it's received with attention and diligence, it will bring forth the fruit that God desires. No matter how entrenched someone may be in what they believe, when they are presented with the alternative of the gospel, the gospel can make a difference. So we must never underestimate the transforming power of the gospel. People are just waiting to hear this message that presents them with an alternative. They are ready to listen to the word of God. And the power of the gospel is authentic. Simon believed, uh, the one who was deceiving others. He heard truth 
and believe the truth. And the response to the gospel, the proper response is belief and then baptism. It has not changed. The church teaches faith in Jesus Christ, repentance, confession, baptism. There is a proclamation of the gospel and the proper response to the proclamation of the gospel is faith and baptism. And we see with Simon, after he is baptized, he follows Philip. There's a need for discipleship. There's a need for people to be able to learn some more. There's a need for them to grow. It can be overwhelming, this Christian walk. And so that's why it's important for Christians to walk with others, uh, walk with those who are new to the faith. It's important for them to be disciple makers. Once a person obeys the gospel, that's not the end, but they need a Philip to follow. Uh, they need someone who will disciple them, who will mentor them. And so as we wrap up, who are the people in your life that you can disciple? Who are you discipling? Uh, who is watching you? Uh, who is pattering, pat pattering their life by the life that you live? Don't forget that you are God's agent of divine disruption here on earth. Uh, God has given you a task. He's given you an audience. He's given you influence. Don't be fooled. Don't be deceived. Stay focused. Remain faithful. And God will bless you in the end uh, to be able to see his face in peace. How has this lesson challenged you? How have divine disruptions impacted your life? Think about it. Share this lesson with others. If you have not subscribed to our YouTube channel, we invite you to subscribe. Click the subscribe button. If you have been blessed by this message, click that thumbs up a button, and we look forward to seeing you next time we have the opportunity to share time together.